I'm Billy Van. Welcome to Bits and Bytes 2, Program 4. Files, or rather filing systems or databases. Is Rolodex a database? All my names and addresses? Well, you could think of it as the Stone Age version. So a computer's database is like an electronic card file? Well, sort of. MS Windows has one built in. Click on Card File. Notepad, Calendar, Calculator, and Card File. Click on the up arrow to get card file to fill the screen. Now, I just type in a name and address. It's your very own little black book. How do I get to the top line of the card? F7. Adams Arthur. And now you can just fill in the details. The street. The city. The country. I always mark whether the person is a sales rep or a customer or a prospect or whatever. With this card file, will I be able to pull out just the sales rep, say? Oh, sure, sure you can. Let's pretend you've already entered a bunch of index cards into the computer. You can scroll through them by hitting page down. Then control home to go back to the beginning again. And they're all in alphabetical order, too. Great. With atoms on top. You can also look at them in the form of a list. Click on View and List View. And these are in alphabetical order too. Click on View Card to go back. Now, if you want to look at any particular card, you just click on it. Or I could look at just one category, say my sales reps. Click on Search and Find. Type Sales and that'll be enough. Find next. Now, if you scroll through, you'll see all the sales reps together. Or you could just look at everyone who lives in Canada. Now, this is what I call a database. Only just. It's not a real database program. Okay, teach. Show me the real thing. There's a bit of terminology we'd better get straight first. When a large collection of data is organized systematically, it is called a database. In other words, a database is a filing system which contains lots of files, each of which contains lots of records, each of which contains detailed items of information which are called fields. For example, if you had information about all the students in a school and all the books and all the pencils, and if all this information were interrelated in a systematic way, then you could call this a database. And the information about one particular class of students could be called a file. And the information about one particular student could be called a record. And each individual item of information about that student could be called a field. It's like Chinese boxes. A field is contained in a record, and the record is contained in a file, and a file is contained in a database. So this whole thing is a database. A file is the set of cards, a record is the contents of one card, and a field is each item on the card, name, address, phone, etc. Victoria, you're right. This card file seems to be organized pretty well. What will a database program do for me that this won't? Well, suppose you wanted to get a list, uh, not of all your sales reps, but just those who are female and who live in Canada. I guess no Rolodex would do that. Well, actually, before the personal computer came along, there were some mechanical card file devices that took a stab at it. Somewhere in between the Rolodex and the computer database comes the McBee key sort, which is punched cards with holes and notches in them. And they were used to analyze the information in a company. We're going to take the finance people out of this and then from the finance people we're going to select the females. And you do not select them, you don't pull them up. What happens is the ones that you select drop out. So we will first of all select the finance department and the finance department is purple so we will go through on the purple slot skew it and then now we're going to find all the females in the finance department 
So we put there and we lift everyone who doesn't belong to that category out and all of the females drop out. And there we have all of the females who work in the finance department. Any DBMS will do that and more. DB who? DBMS, Database Management System. A database program that could tell you that... Not only how many sales reps I have who are female Canadians, but how many of them are over 35 and have sold more than $20,000 worth of hot air balloons. And have grandmothers with blue eyes who live in Missouri, for that matter. But these big database programs can get really complicated, can't they? Well, some are pretty sophisticated, but others are fairly simple. Show me, as Grandma would say. Look at Works for Windows. Okay, close card file. And click on the Microsoft Works icon. Oh, so it's not just a database. No. No, it's an integrated program that lumps together several different applications. Choose database. Start by designing a form. The first field name could be... Name. Colon. Enter. Width. 20 spaces. That uh, should be enough. Okay. Now, to keep it simple, we'll limit this form to sales reps, uh, country, sex, age, and sales to date. Now you can fill in the data. Name. Wendy Craig or Craig Wendy. Press tab to go to the next field name. Sex. How many men do you know called Wendy? <laughs> well, the computer doesn't know it's a female name. Okay. Female. We'll fill in the rest. You get the idea? Assume we put in all your names and addresses. Now you can look at them as a list if you like. See the icon that looks like a set of cards is now highlighted. Click on the one next to it that looks like a list. Oh, it's the same deal as Windows card file. Until you see what it can do. Click on the icon with a question mark. You're now in the query mode and you can do a key sort. Opposite country, type Canada. Opposite sex, type... Male. Hey, wait a minute. I thought you were going to sort out the females. Six foot two, broad shoulders, dark hair. <coughs> <coughs> oh, mind your own business. Over 35. How do I type that? The greater than sign. The right-facing V on the bottom row of keys. Same deal for more than $20,000, I guess. Now, click on the list icon to go back to the list. And there are all the Canadian males who are over 35 and have sold more than $20,000 worth of balloons. And you could get a print out of that, of course, or customize it, however you want. I see what you mean. You couldn't do any of this with Cardfile. No. Now, an electronic Rolodex like Cardfile is what's often called a free-form database. It'll only sort data for you alphabetically and into categories, plus do simple retrieval. But the kind of database management system we've just looked at, called a flat file database, because it only looks for one file at a time, is different. This type of database can also search for specific data fields. Selecting what you want and excluding what you don't want. That's right. Having done that, it'll generate any sort of report that you like. So if I created a database of my inventory of balloons, for instance, I could use it to print out packing lists or bills of lading? Or you could use mailing lists of your customers to generate personalized letters. Mail merge? At last! What I do here in the membership department is coordinate the on-air membership campaigns. And I have to generate letters to volunteers all the time. So what I do is uh, download lists of names and addresses of volunteers from our main computer onto Word, onto my Mac. Uh, so that I, in a proper list format, so that I can merge the names and addresses with letters to send out to volunteers to confirm their attendance during our on-air membership campaigns, as well as to thank them for coming and helping out, and to thank sponsors, all sorts of things. Here we have the letter that's written in Word with all of the data fields defined. The data fields are the first name, last name, street, city, and the first name, and the fields in the letter correspond to the data fields in the list file. When the letter is merged with the data list file, the letter will pick up each volunteer's first name, last name, street, 
and city, and then the first name again, and insert it in the proper spot in the letter so that everyone gets their own personalized letter. And we'll merge the letter with the list, and we'll save the results in a new file. It's asking for what list we want to use, so we'll tell it. And we can just scroll through and look to make sure everyone's there. And it worked. Okay. So that's combining letters with names and addresses. What if I wanted to combine my sales reps and customers with my orders and my inventory? Could I do that with a database program? Well, it'd be tough with the simplest type of flat file database because they can only deal with information from one file at a time. If you want to deal with several different files simultaneously, you need a relational database. A relational database is like a very clever clerk who can juggle a number of different files at the same time, keeping them all in sync and constantly updated. It looks like magic, but it isn't. It's a trick. It works like this. James Bond puts in an order for a skeleton key. The database program updates the orders file with Bond's ID number and the item number and the quantity ordered. And now the trick. The files may look different, and most of their content does indeed differ, but there's just enough of a common thread or relation running through them to link them all together. The relation that the orders file shares with the customer file is the customer ID number. So the orders file can automatically share the contents of the customer file. It also has a relationship going with the inventory file, since they share the item number. So as soon as the order comes in from Bond, the orders file can automatically update the quantity of skeleton keys in stock, reducing it from 70 to 69. At the same time, the orders file can check the price of a skeleton key and update the balance of 007's account in the customer file. Finally, the orders file can pull all its own information plus the information in the customer and inventory files to generate an invoice. That's the secret of how our relational database juggler manages to keep control of all those totally separate looking files. Not by smoke and mirrors, but simply because the files aren't really separate at all. They're all tied together by invisible threads. So a relational database not only sorts and retrieves and searches and reports, it also interrelates your data. Couldn't have put it better myself. What are the most popular relational database programs? DBase4, FoxPro, Paradox. A relational database is a non-redundant collection of data designed to be used by many different applications. That is the dictionary definition. Simply, it is a group of files that are or can be related like in a video store. Once you change the information then it's available to all of the different applications that use it. If we were going to add a customer for instance we would go into maintenance of the database and we will start keying in a name. And then we say, do it. Okay, we can go into the orders and say we want rentals. Now that we've entered John Young, we will go and find him. He's renting Indiana Jones Temple of Doom at $2, and it will be due back tomorrow. And then we say, do it. And John Young came in and rented uh, Temple of Doom. We had 11 copies, and now it shows that we only have 10. We have the customers' memberships, what films are available, the or what the ordered films to come in, what the status of those are, plus the status of the database itself, including the customers, the films, and the order. Now we can't live without relational databases. It's uh, part of 
every computerized system now. 20 years ago, it would have been impossible to even consider this type of, the type of applications that we have now because we have database technology. That's pretty powerful stuff. It looks as if it could get really complicated. And yet we make use of relational databases all the time, Victoria, whenever you reserve a flight. Uh, the system that we use is actually twofold. There's a PC that we use here which contains just general information locally. Uh, our main database is in Winnipeg and our computer system in Toronto, actually worldwide, always accesses Winnipeg to get all the information and within a split second we will have the answer back in Toronto. If uh, someone calls up and is interested in flying to Los Angeles, all I have to do is put in a couple of transactions. I'll put in the outbound date, which will be the 15th of February. Then I will put in the return date, which we'll say is the 27th of February. And I will put in the city code for that airport, which is Los Angeles. The computer automatically knows that I am in Toronto, and all I do is hit my shopping basket. It automatically requests the fare and then from there, it requests the availability Toronto to Los Angeles on the 15th. And then it requests the availability from Los Angeles, Toronto on the 27th. I can then advise the passenger that there is a fare available of $368 plus tax. And then I can offer them the choice of flights. And then I hit my passenger in the seat button. That will automatically book one seat from Toronto to Los Angeles. And that will automatically go to our database in Winnipeg and remove one seat from the inventory. And I'll take a moment. Prior to the computers, they used to have a manual system where they had a blackboard and the flights were written down on the blackboard and an agent would take a card, put it along a little conveyor belt and it would go to someone on the blackboard who would then erase the number of seats that were available. As well, at that time, there were only three fares available. There was a first class, uh, there was an economy fare, and then there was a long stay fare, or a minimum stay of 21 days. So sometimes we have displays of as much as uh, 30 or 40 fares that we have to deal with. Billy, so far all the database programs we've seen have been on PCs. Well, there's also a lot of database software for the Mac, of course. One program that's really interesting is called HyperCard. Click on Hard Disk. Click on HyperCard Ideas. Idea Stacks. Now click on Stack Ideas. These are some ready-made index card formats. They give you dozens of different designs for a whole range of applications. I'll have a look at a wine inventory. There's also a menu, a grocery list, an order form, a library, a calendar. Very impressive. But apart from the fancy graphics, what does this do for me that any other electronic card file can't do? Well, go to the HyperCard home screen. The quickest way is to hold down the command key. It looks like a square with ears. And hit H. Press the left arrow key. Ah, there's more to this than meets the eye. Choose authoring. I'm going to become a computer programmer. Hey, this is your big moment, kid. Get the file menu and choose open stack. Choose hot. This is an index we've started to prepare for you. We've also put in a few simple index cards. Use the right and left arrow keys to see them. HyperCard is a sort of do-it-yourself Windows kit. You can create your own little windows and program them to do different things when you click on them. So, what am I going to program? You're going to program the boxes themselves, or at least one of them, so that when you click on it, it will take you to the corresponding set of index cards. I'll show you. Click on Tools. Drag the Tools menu down so it breaks off from the menu at the top. This is like a paint program. Well, that's how we did the boxes on your screen. We've also already programmed most of them for you. Click on Prospects and you'll see. Now, to get back to the table of contents, just click on it. So these aren't just plain old boxes, they've come alive. That's right. 
They're what HyperCard calls buttons. Now you're going to make a sales reps button. Click on the button tool, the middle of the top row in the tools menu. Click on objects and new button. It really does look alive. We'll move it in place and click on the white space to stop it shimmering. Now click on the new button twice. Button name, sales reps. Click on link to. Uh, which card? Use the arrow key to get the sales reps index card. Now click on this card and on the pointing finger in the tools box. And now I just click on sales reps and to get back to the table of contents, click on that. I get it. With this live button business, I can make a sort of multi-choice interactive database. Which is how all kinds of data is being organized nowadays. From dictionaries to encyclopedias, there's one on your PC. The Concise Columbia Encyclopedia. Now this comes on a version of Microsoft Word for Windows that integrates the program with a multimedia reference library. Okay. I'll look up automobile. Click on search and type automobile. And search again. 247 different entries on automobiles. I'll just choose automobile itself. Click on the little bell and you'll hear the word pronounced. Automobile. Of course, your computer needs to be equipped with audio for this, right? Yes. Well, you see, Victoria, you've got some little speakers now. Oh, and everything is cross-referenced. I'll click on internal combustion engine. Scroll down a bit and you'll see a control panel that'll animate the drawing. Click on the play button. In a gasoline engine, a volatile mixture of fuel and air is ignited within a cylinder. This must be a huge database. Is it all stored on my hard disk? No, on a CD-ROM. You've got one built in now on your system unit. CD-ROM. Where have I heard that before? Oh, yes, it was on the spec sheets. Compact disk, read-only memory. Just like a regular CD, you can't record on it. No, but it has a huge storage capacity. The equivalent of hundreds of floppy disks. This is another kind of memory, then? Well, in a sense, yes. A kind of storage memory. But it's normally referred to as storage capacity. So there's RAM memory, storage capacity on a hard disk, storage capacity on a floppy disk, and now also storage capacity on a CD-ROM. Is that it? Well, not quite. There's still cache memory. I knew there was a cache in it somewhere. Sort this memory business out for me, will you, Billy? If you can imagine a public library system in the shape of a pyramid, you can get some idea of how the various types of computer memory are organized. At the top of the pyramid sits a quick-witted but very tiny librarian, the CPU, with a minute built-in ROM memory, which contains just enough information to keep the system going, but which can dispense this information at lightning speed. Average capacity of the CPU memory, 200 bytes. On the floor below in the main library, there's much more information, but it takes just a fraction longer to get at it. This is the computer's RAM memory. Average capacity, 2 megabytes. Below the main library is a repository, a huge vault of information that is quite a bit slower to access the computer's hard disk. Average capacity, 80 megabytes. Beneath the stacks runs a driveway where truckloads of information can come and go of potentially infinite number, but of even slower access. The computer's floppy disks. Average capacity, 1.44 megabytes, but an almost limitless supply. At the base of the whole structure is the central reference library a vast extent, but slowest of all to access, the computer's CD-ROM disks. Average capacity, 650 megabytes each. 
As an optional extra, this electronic library system can include a little cache of frequently used information that the librarian keeps under her desk. A limited collection, but very speedily accessible. The computer's cache memory. Average capacity, 64 kilobytes, which saves many trips to the main library, thereby giving a boost to the entire system. So the whole pyramid of memory runs the gamut from very small but very fast at its apex to very large but very slow at its base. With the nifty little cache memory, capable of speeding up the whole process to such an extent that you could say it's positively cash in the bank. I know how to organize all my data. Now I need to know how to keep in touch with everyone. So you can't wait to hear what I'm going to tell you next time, right? about computer communications, modems, bulletin boards, local area networks, and email. I'm Billy Vance. And I'm Victoria Stokel.